So let's see if this thing works. Perfect. So I want to talk uh, in the next maybe 45 minutes a little bit about free will, hallucinated agency, and anarchic robot syndrome. And uh, this is not going to be an academic talk or a technical science talk. You can ask me the difficult questions later if you want to. So I want to begin by asking what is the will? Is there something like that in the first place? About five years ago, we had um, a dramatic uh, discussion in Germany about freedom of the will. It was basically some famous neuroscientists saying, this is over, there is no such thing. And then the philosophers got completely crazy and said, this is not something you have to de decide. The question is a philosophical question. It belongs into our discipline. And then the neuroscientist said, you're beginning to understand the problem. It's not your question anymore. It's over. It's answered. And then it exploded over years in the public. But nobody ever asked, um, what is this? A will. I want to ask, can one hallucinate a will? And most importantly tonight, why is it your own will? How does it become your own will tied to your own first-person perspective? Then I want to <clears throat> show you some examples from an interdisciplinary research project in which I've worked for five years as a philosopher, where we tried to get the sense of self into avatars and robots. And um, I'll show you two examples and ask an ethical question about the will in robots and end by a general idea. But let's just start um, with the question, what is this thing, uh, a will? Have you ever seen one? What color does the will have? Have you ever touched one or held one? How many grams does it weigh? It seems it is not something we can find in the brain. So the first thing we notice, I think, is it's not something in the objective world. I don't know, how many of you have ever heard the name of Benjamin Libert in their lives? So this is very old stuff from 1985. I'm not going to bombard you with all of the science, but if one looks into this, one sees that the neuroscientists can tell us a lot about the conscious experience of having a will. So we know a lot about the objective conditions of the subjective experience. For instance, and that is very old, um, uh, scientific research, one can show that before you make a decision to move your arm and before you have the conscious experience of making this decision, there is a lot happening in the brain unconsciously. I'm not going into any details, but this is one example of things that we know. Um, so. At that time, the idea was there cannot be something but free will. The guy who discovered this was freaked out by it, tried to find a way out of it, and said, OK, but we can still stop the action. We have veto control. We can stop it. Now we know there's, of course, also an unconscious precursor of veto control, right? So it looks like there is always an unconscious precursor. This is Patrick Haggard. I don't know, have any of you heard this name before? He's an eminent researcher in England, and he has followed all this up, uh, this um, debate on free will, and he has made many more detailed contributions that show your experience of willing something has to do with the moment where you select a specific action. But I'm not going into all of this. So um, the first upshot is we don't find anything we could call the will in the brain. We know a lot about the physical conditions. It's a phenomenological concept. It describes something in conscious experience, in your own inner experience. 
But free will also is a social institution. Maybe we can come back to this in the discussion at the end. The deepest problem, I think, is, but why is this will your own will? It arises, acts of will happen, but why do you have to self-ascribe this? Maybe the Buddhists are right, have been right for 2,500 years, that wills are there, but selves are not. That actions exist, but agents do not exist. So why do we talk like this, my own will? How does this experience come about that, is, that it is my own will? I think that's the deepest problem. And if it is a phenomenological concept, it should be possible to hallucinate a will. So that's the next question I want to ask. Can you have an experience of will and it's just not true? So here are two classical experiments about hallucinated agency. Imagine you are this person here in a scientific uh, experiment. And the experiment goes like this. You both have headphones on, two subjects. And you can use something like an Ouija board. It's like one mouse. And you can both point to these pictures from a children book. There are swans and houses and cars and fire. And sometimes you can really force it, or you can go along with what your friend does. And it always goes like this. For 30 seconds on the headphones, they give you words to distract you. That's what they tell you. They say house, and fire, and window, and apple. And then at a certain time, the words stop, and music comes, and your idea is you have to wait a little bit, and then point to something and rate how much you have willed this. Was it your own arm movement or were you just pulled along by the other person, the other subject? What you do not know is that this is not a subject. This is actually the professor's friend. It's a confederate. It doesn't hear music or words on the headphones. It just hears something like, you point to the swan at three, two, one, now. And the interesting result is, if we make you hear the word swan one second before this person points to the swan and your arm makes the same movement, you have a very robust conscious experience. I wanted this and I did this. I moved my arm myself. So they both wear headphones. They were told to move the mouse around the computer screen for 30 seconds, random words, 10 second intervals of music. And then their task was to stop the mouse on an object after a few seconds. And then they had to note something down, rate it. How strong was this, your personal intentionality? But this person is not another subject received instructions from the experimenters. And here you see, this is the act where your arm moves and points, say, to the house. And this is the distance where the thought comes in your mind because you hear the voice. And the thing is, if you just make you hear the voice house one second before, and then the other person really forces the mouse pointer on the house, you have the complete experience, I decided to do this, I moved my arm. Although it's not true, your arm was pulled along with the mouse pointer, right? So the reason this is a classic study from Wegener and Wheatley, the way these people understand this is there is an unconscious cause of your action. There's a real causal path. Something in your brain makes your arm move and point to the house. There's also an unconscious cause of the thought comes in through the headphone. And there's a real causal path, so the conscious thought, house. And then your brain constructs a subjective causal path that says, oh, I wanted this, and this is why I did this. And then you have the conscious experience, and you've hallucinated the whole thing. You never moved your arm, but you have the experience you moved your arm. 
Here is another example how one can cause a hallucination of will. You can't see it in this picture, but there's a little red point here in the cingulum in the brain. It's a classical experiment that was done. You stimulated a patient at 40 millivolts, with 40 millivolts in the brain. Then you get three different things, three different kinds of conscious experiences. The first thing the patient reports, it gets an urge to grasp the next thing it can grasp. A very strong urge to do this as a conscious experience. The second thing that happens is exploratory eye movement, scanning both sides of the visual field. The eyes start to hectically look for what you can grip. And then after the patient localizes a target, the arm automatically grips the thing and holds it. So you have both components, right? Just with an electrode in the brain, you, sim you cause a conscious will, a searching movement, and a body movement. You have all things, you know? You have the bodily correlate, you have the conscious correlate. I'm not interpreting this. I'm just telling you things we know today. There's another classic study by Isaac Fried in Los Angeles, 1991. This is something every philosopher has to know. You know, you put an electrode in the brain, not for fun, because somebody has to go under, uh, undergo surgery. It's to help people. And you turn up the volume a little bit and say, do you have any conscious experience? And then the person says, yes, I have a movement fantasy. I have a fantasy of reaching my arm out. Then you put up the electricity a little bit stronger and say, yeah, now I have an urge to move my arm, very strong. And you put a little higher voltage and the arm moves, you know? So these are the kinds of things we know today. Uh, and every philosopher should know, but the real problem is, okay, so are these things in the brain? Yeah, maybe interesting, maybe not. So there are these conditions, but what does it have to do with the conscious self? How many of you know the rubber hand illusion? Have ever heard the word? It's a classical illusion that was discovered in 1998. And you can do this tomorrow. You can do this at home in the kitchen with your friends. You just need some dishwashing gloves a rubber hand, and uh, you stuff them with cotton, and you take some Q-tips or some brushes, and then the simple thing is you stroke the hand that you cannot see anymore, and the rubber hand that doesn't feel, but that you can see synchronously. At the same time, you stroke it. After 20 to 90 seconds, you will have, your subject will have a very interesting experience, namely first, that the rubber hand is part of their own bodily self. And the second one is that they feel the seen touch in the rubber hand, right? So you can construct the conscious experience of owning a rubber hand like this. If you try this, don't giggle and laugh, right? And don't look into the other person's eye, you have to look Relax and look into the rubber hand, and after 20, 30 seconds, this will begin to happen. You will feel something in the rubber hand. So the brain creates a model that this is suddenly your own hand. There are a lot of scientific things I could tell you. So these are the two areas in the brain, in premotor cortex, that light up in the moment where you have the illusion, in the moment where you have the feeling, this is my own hand, there is a tactile receptive field in the brain for the touch, and there's a visual receptive field in the brain, and the brain realizes these two things come absolutely synchronously, and it just puts it together, right? Uh, it melts it in its causal explanation of the world. If you do this,
this tomorrow, uh, you should have a hammer ready behind your back or something like this. Uh, if your friend <coughs> has the illusion standing, attack the rubber hand and see what happens. <coughs> this is, of course, conceptually, I mean, I'm a philosopher and I'm a neuroscientist. This is interesting um, because it shows that this is not just a high-level fantasy or something. It shows that, so to speak, the brain believes that this is your own hand too and immediately tries to pull it away. This has been really also integrated in the unconscious model of what is the self in the brain. There's not only the conscious experience you right ha have right now, there's something much bigger. It's the unconscious self model and that acts in that way. Oh, okay. So a knife is good, a hammer is good. You can try dildos. <laughs> Um, this is patient AZ. This is a woman in Switzerland who was born without arms and legs. She had a PhD. She was a very intelligent woman. And <clears throat> since she could remember, you all know what phantom limbs are. You've heard of it. Some people after amputations have phantom limbs, right? Often after six weeks it goes away, but they still feel the old arm. This woman has always had phantom limbs. And they went there and asked her, um, how real are they on a scale from zero to seven? Zero means I have no conscious experience. Seven means it's as real as my shoulders or my belly. And you see some interesting details. You see, for instance, like here, the shins they are half as real, so to speak, as the normal body. You also see in this body model of that patient, these three middle toes are not differentiated. She cannot distinguish them. But another interesting thing is the right hand is more real than the left hand. The right hand has never existed. How do you explain that? The model of the right hand is more real than the model of the left hand. Maybe we can come back to this in the discussion. This is Peter Brugger in Zürich. He <clears throat> investigated this woman. And you could do things like ask this woman, put her in a brain scanner and say, touch with your phantom fingers, your thumb with your index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and so on. And every time you have the feeling of contact, you tell us. And at every time there was this contact, there was a specific area in the brain that lights up. So you see a self-model really, a body model, really is something in the brain too. And if you followed me until now, you should already begin to understand that right now you are not in touch with your own body, right? As you're sitting and listening. What you experience is the content of a model in your brain, right? We have a long tradition in, uh, in the Western world. Aristotle, for instance, said the soul is the form of the body. Aristotle was a naturalist. He said it perishes as death, but it's the form principle that integrates parts. Could it be this? I mean, what is this woman experiencing? What is it that she's experiencing? Could it be a global model of the shape of the body? Is it maybe innate? Spinoza, many centuries later in the 16th paragraph of the Ethics said, the soul is the idea that the body creates of itself. Is that the idea the body creates of itself in its own brain? You will ask yourself, what has all of this to do with philosophy? Why is this interesting? Why does this guy does think, do things like this? Well, if one wants to understand the will, one also needs a theory of consciousness and one needs a theory of self-consciousness. For instance, one needs to know what is the most simple form of having a self. We want to know tonight, why is this thing the will, like the rubber hand, your own will, how exactly do you identify with a body, 
right? You've just learned that what you experience is not your body right now, right? It's the content of a virtual body in your brain. But why do you identify with it? I will, in 10 minutes, show you new forms of actions, out-of-body experience, and of course there are all these ethical and cultural problems. Maybe we can come back to them in the discussion. So there's a big theory in the background. It's called the self-model theory of subjectivity. I'm not going to say a single word about this theory, but if anybody's interested, there's an absolutely unreadable book uh, at MIT Press. And uh, I'll tell you <clears throat> how I got into the research I'm going to show you two examples of. So in this book, I ruined my reputation by writing about out-of-body experiences. Is there anybody in this audience who's ever had the feeling that they are, have been out of their body? Maybe during surgery, after an accident, being very stoned? something like that. Uh, maybe somebody is an epileptic in this audience. So 8 to 15 people, uh, 8 to 15 percent of the people in their world, in the world have this experience of being consciously outside of their body one time in their lives. And um, now something happened in 2002. Olaf Blanke, a German neurologist, did this study with brain stimulation on a young epileptic woman and they, for the first time they caused an out-of-body experience by directly stimulating in certain uh, areas in the brain with a, an electrode. So you, the patient is completely conscious and suddenly this young woman said, wow, I see everything from above, I'm outside. Uh, and um, then they were looking for a theory and I found my book, and I always cooperate with neuroscientists, and I'm going to want to show you one or two of results of this cooperation. So two things we know that can be caused by direct stimulation of the brain is this thing, you already know it, it's the classical out-of-body experience where you have the feeling of flying out of your body, sometimes you see it from the outside, but then there's also something else that is called a feeling of a presence. It's not a visual illusion, but maybe sometimes you've had the feeling that there is somebody in the room, even though you know you're alone. And there are people who have this all the time and re right behind them, and there is nothing there. And if they see a neurologist, um, and the neurologist says, we think it's something with your body image in the brain, it doesn't really help them. So um, this feeling of a physical presence is something that can also be um, caused by electrical stimulation of the brain. So this is a paper of 2007. This is Olaf Blanke, um, the main researcher, neurologist, epileptologist from Germany. That's Tej Tadi. Um, the computer freak and ingenious technician from India, and Binya Langenhager, who was the main author of the study. And this happened like this. They said to me, okay, we can't read your philosophical books, we can't understand anything. Uh, tell us what we should do. And I said, I want a whole body version of the rubber hand illusion for philosophical reasons. And then they said, eh, you're crazy, this cannot be done, because the brain never sees the body from the outside. And then I said something even more crazy about virtual meta, and they said, come on, oh, wait a minute, we have a virtual reality lab. And then we did, we created something that is called a full body illusion, and it works like this. You stand in a virtual reality, you have these glasses on, and you are being filmed from a camera from behind and a system called a 3D encoder inserts your body image into the virtual reality. And then you, for the first time, you see yourself from the outside in your life, and again, somebody comes and strokes your back. So we created something like this classical Magritte picture, right, uh, that you would see yourself uh, from behind 
using virtual reality technology. Direct vision of, of the subject's uh, own body. We stroke the back um, um, of the experimental subject. We had a camera, not in front, but in, uh, behind the subject, two meters behind, who was filming the stroking and in real time projected this information to a head-mounted display. This is what you see. This was in front of the, the subject eye. So all the subject was seeing is the stroking, but now at your back, while at the same time you see your own body being touched by two meters in front of you. And some of the subjects reported that they very strongly felt um, that of stroking, sorry. Um, the subject eyes, we asked, we displaced them to another position in the room and then we asked them with eyes closed to walk back to the position. And when they were doing this, they actually did not go back to the real position, to my position right now, but rather were closer actually to where they saw the body, the direct vision of... of so, um, sorry, there's something in German there. Uh, so, um, the uh, idea is that after you have had the illusion of being pulled into this virtual body, like a global version of the rubber hand illusion. You can test people and it lasts for many minutes. You blindfold them, turn them around and say, walk back to where you think you've been standing. And people walk closer to the avatar and not where they have been really physically standing. And this is interesting because it shows that the spatial frame of reference in the brain has been changed. The unconscious spatial frame uh, of reference and the illusion really does something. So you understand we are trying to get at the mechanism by which you own something. Own a rubber hand, own an artificial virtual body, just like you can own a tool while you use it. You know, if you were going to um, blindfold your eyes at home in your apartment and use a blind person's cane and just walk around all the time, after 30 minutes or so, you would become the feeling of touch in the tip of the cane. You can get really tactile sens uh, sensations. It is like it's an extension of your arm. We know many examples of this, but today we're embedding robots and avatars into the self-model and um, trying to find out what that does. So these people are completely gaga. You know, all the people in California, uh, immortality, uploading, we're all gonna, you know, go into avatars and this is the beginning and everything's gonna be nice. It's uh, form a new religion, the singularity movement uh, with tech evangelists and ultimately it's of course a form of mortality denial. And I have always been telling uh, the neuroscientists, the engineers with whom I was working, I don't think the human self model can be copied out of the brain into say a large computer because it is anchored in the physical body because it is anchored in heartbeat, in interoception, in this inner sense of your body, which you have all your blood vessels, the sense of balance. It's kind of locked in the hardware and you can't just copy it out into an avatar. And uh, of course your emotion also arise out of this body as it is felt from the inside. But I would just want to show you two experiments before I come to the end to give you an idea of what these people do, uh, in which way this research goes. So this is another experiment uh, which works as follows. You stand there in virtual reality again, but the avatar you are seeing of your own body has a silhouette. And that silhouette is you know, expanding all the time, like in that picture. Now, if without telling you, one synchronizes it with your heartbeat, you also measure your heartbeat, then the identification becomes very strong. This is called cardiovisual signaling. And it is interesting because you turn something that you normally only feel from the inside in your body, in virtual reality you turn it into something in the outside, in something you can see around the body. It's like, you know, if you turn a sock around. So this is just to give you an idea what they do. There comes this philosophical criticism from my side. 
I said the introceptive self model is something you can never get into an avatar, but then they couple an avatar to the heartbeat. You know, you're still not there. You're not in there because it's a causal loop. It's like the, an instrument that is being embedded. But that's just an example of where all this goes. And um, I want to talk, show you one last experiment about this Vera project. So this was the first thing we did. This is another thing Swedish researcher Henrik Ersson did that works very well also. You sit and you are being stroked on your chest and you can't see that and then you have the feeling of jumping behind. Or you put people on a table like this and you film them from the top and stroke them on the back and then the interesting thing is some people fall out of the body to the floor and some people fly up if you do that. Uh, today, neuroscientists can also do that in the scanner. I'm not telling you the story here, it's complicated stuff, but you can see it's very interesting to find out what is different in the brain of those people that fly up and those people that fall down, right? There are robots, all kinds of cool stuff. Here you see your crazy philosopher, you know, I wear this um, suit with sensors, I'm being filmed by 18 infrared cameras, and then you can control an avatar with your own body while being in virtual reality um, yourself. One time I came in, the PhD student, she very much liked dancing salva, salsa. So in the coffee break when nobody worked, she just put 16 copies of herself in virtual reality and another 16 copies who stood on their head and then she danced salsa with them, you know. Uh, this is the way this is going. Um, it's going to be very interesting. So there was this five-year EU project called the Virtual Embodiment and Robotic Re-Embodiment Project. And these people had two goals. The first goal was to create a robust sense of presence in a virtual reality, to be there. That's actually old school. You know, everybody does that. But the special thing is that we wanted to make these effects stronger and didn't really work the effects from the first experiment of 2007. What would it take to own an avatar, to fully identify with an avatar? And here's a last um, example how the will can bypass the body and experiment. This was done, it's not my work in any way, um, by these two geniuses uh, from Herzliya and Tel Aviv, um, Doron Friedman and Ori Kohan. Uh, and the idea was like this, you are in a scanner, you have goggles on, you can see out of the eyes of a robot, that robot is 4,000 kilometers away in southern France. You're just connected through the internet. And you imagine movements, moving your right arm, your left arm. And a complicated procedure tries to extract these movement intentions from your brain and send them as motor commands to the robot. So first, you lie in the scanner and you have to practice a little bit with an avatar. Can you, just by imagining movements, simulating movements in your self-model, control an avatar in a computer? If that works, people try to do it um, with real robots. A subject lies down in the fMRI scanner in the Wiseman Institute of Science, in Israel. The subject imagines moving his left hand, right hand, or his feet. Our system processes the data received from the fMRI and decodes the thought patterns in near real time. The decoded mental activities are sent over the internet to France. This is what you see. You are in Tel Aviv, uh, in Herzliya in a scanner. This is your colleague in Montpellier in France. 
the humanoid robot in France receives the high-level commands and performs them. The subject in Israel sees the world through the eyes of the robot in France. An assistant in France gestures to the subject, suggesting the areas to explore in the room. The robot is very expensive and very fragile, so an ITRA assistant holds the robot in case it might fall over. So this, there's a will, right? But that will somehow bypasses the non-neural body. It's a will to move, just an imagined motion. But there's another physical body carrying out the will. And you tell me, we can discuss this later, what you think this means about the will. Do we learn anything about the will from that? So. These are just some examples where the modern cooperation between philosophy of mind and neuroscience and virtual reality technology, which way that is going. Um, I have introduced a technical term that's called PSM actions. PSM means phenomenal self-model, conscious self-model. There are some actions, and this is historically new, we have never had this, it's a bit like magic where you just imagine an action by simulating it in your mind and you completely bypass the biological body. You go as if it were with the will into a medial environment, a robot or an avatar. And now I want to discuss a thought experiment with you, which I have called anarchic robot syndrome. There is something called anarchic hand syndrome that's long known. Um, some patients with some brain lesions have the problem that when they, for instance, they button up their shirt, the other hand comes and buttons it up again. When uh, they reach for the telephone, the other hand you know, interrupts the call, often with a sense of conflict. After a certain brain uh, problem, they lose control over one arm and that arm acts as if, as if it had a will of its own, you know. And it's very difficult for them. That's called anarchic hand syndrome. Now imagine the following thing. You are controlling a robot just like I showed you in the video. You're controlling the robot. And you're pretty much identified with it. And you're moving in a social scene and then the door opens and somebody comes in and it's the new husband of your wife that you have just divorced. It's the person that has destroyed all your dreams, all your future plans. You get the sense of emotional hurt that arises. It's very painful to see that person. You very quickly have an aggressive impulse that arises in you automatically. It's completely normal. And before you can do anything, the robot has gone and with one big stroke killed that person, right? It's like it slipped out of your hand. This is maybe pretty realistic because in the biological body you have a better sense of veto control. You can control your impulses. But if in the future we get more and more embedded into these artificial realities and action systems, we could have something like anarchic robot uh, syndrome. We could sometimes have our will being realized, and then what would you do if you were in court and people say, you are responsible, you killed that person with the robot. And you said, no, honestly, really, I didn't want to kill the person. I just had this automatic aggressive impulse. And I couldn't stop it anymore. We want to believe you, but how exactly will we decide if objectively you had the ability for the necessary form of top-down control? How will we know that if people said, you know, I couldn't, the robot just did that? Uh, and that shows many things about the will, which I maybe would like to discuss with you, but the question is, if something like that happens in the future? Just think of military robots, military applications, and somebody says, I didn't want this, right? Um, how are you going to dis uh, um, decide the question, whose will was it? Where was the will in this um, virtual reality? 
when should we say that a human agent is ethically responsible or culpable in a legal sense? What are the functional boundaries of the will of autonomous agency? And what ability do you need to have so one can say you are responsible for these actions? It was your will, your intention. You owned that. What are the conditions? I think we will have to answer these questions. I think there are no yes and no answers. Responsibility, accountability, and autonomy come in degrees. There is something like a depth of embodiment, and there is a, de de uh, a degree of being able to control your own will or not. And that degree, that is really important for ethics and politics. We need to know nor more about it. So this brings me to the end. Um, is there something like a willing self? Does this concept make sense? Or is there no such thing? What do you think? Is there something that does the willing? Many people imagine it like that. There is something like the neural correlate of consciousness in the brain and it's like an internal television screen and I sit there and I look at the content of consciousness. And I can also control things like somebody in a crane, right? You can, I can will something and do it. There is a little man in the head that does the willing and does the experiencing. But it cannot be like this. Philosophers call this the homunculus fallacy because if there is a little man that wills something or sees something, there must be something in that little man's head, another little television screen, another little control pad with another little man doing it. And so on in eternity, it is not possible that there is some kind of little controlling entity self homunculus because it leads to this kind of problem. I think it is like this. The will, what we call the will, is a part of the conscious self model in your head. The conscious model of you as a whole person. But you are not able to experience this model as a model right now. Therefore, it's completely transparent and you identify with the content of the model. And that is how you get the conscious experience of I am someone and I am a willing self and it is my own will. Although there is nobody there. So all you actually have is something like a transparent avatar in your brain and you look through that. And that's how you appropriate acts of will. Thanks for being so patient. <laughs>